Uh, when it comes to movies that are a part of a bigger series, franchises, if you will, um, I have one particular franchise for me that stands out above the rest. It's not the Marvel series, it's not uh, Spider-Man or the Batman or anything like that. The series that I love is Star Wars. Yes, I'm hearing some shouts of joy there. And look, maybe I love Star Wars because of how epic it is. It is so grand and epic. Um, maybe I love it because of, you know, these worlds that are mysterious, that these interesting and sometimes ugly creatures inhabit. Um, I think maybe it's also because of the sense of nostalgia I get from watching it. I grew up watching this as a kid. I think it's probably a combination of all of those factors. But in Star Wars, one of the main themes that runs throughout the whole series is this idea that this tiny group of rebels forms and rises up and they are willing to risk everything, including their lives, to come up against the Galactic Empire. Now, the Empire isn't a small, small empire. They are gigantic. You know, they've got more troops than Rebellion. They've got better starships. Um, they've got better weaponry. They've got control over the entire galaxy. And hey, they've got the Death Star. And what do the Rebels have in comparison? Well, they've got a couple of droids and a hairy Wookiee. And that's about it. Without going into too much more of the detail, just this picture alone makes you see that for the Rebels, on paper, any battle that they would have fighting against the Empire, you would not think that they stood a single chance of winning. They're faced with this extremely difficult situation that seems just completely hopeless. There's no chance that they can survive. And in our lifetimes, there's probably going to be situations that we experience that could be described as being without hope or hopeless even. Some of those situations will be small or have small consequences, but other situations will have much bigger consequences. So how should we respond when things seem hopeless. And this morning, as we focus in on God's Word, we are continuing in our series on the book of Ruth. And Ruth has found herself faced with a difficult situation, a situation that seems like it is one that is just without hope. And last week, Alex looked at chapter 1, and we learn about this character that Ruth had, that here is this woman who has this desperate situation, and here are all the things. She ha her husband died. She was childless. She was a Moabite, to top it all off. And, you know, Moabites, uh, Moab was a decidedly ungodly nation, and so they would not associate with the Israelites. But that is not all. Naomi, her mother-in-law, she is completely distraught as well. She's had to deal with the death of her husband. She's had to deal with the death of not only one of her sons, of both of her sons. And in chapter 1, we learn that Naomi is travelling with her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpha, and they reach this crossroads, this turning point, and Naomi bids them farewell. She says, go, my daughters, um, it'll be good for you, I bless you, go and find new husbands in Moab. And Orpha, she says a tearful farewell, but Naomi, uh, Ruth rather, has other plans. She chooses to stay with Naomi despite the circumstances that they are facing. Ruth chooses to show this love regardless of the hardships. And even though Naomi said, go start a new life, turn, a clean slate is here for you. Despite this, Ruth demonstrates this selfless love. She says these words to Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. But Naomi kind of harps up to Ruth and she responds back, she says, you know, don't call me Naomi, which means sweet or pleasant. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter, because God's actually dealt really bitterly with me. That's her response to Ruth. And it says that Naomi uh, went out full, but she returned empty. And so she's in this state of emptiness at the moment. So everything about this situation kind of seems hopeless. And chapter 1 finishes by um, them telling us that Naomi leaves Moab, she's accompanied by Ruth, and they arrive in Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was starting to happen. 
And that sets the scene for our focus today, which is Ruth chapter 2. So I invite you, if you've got your Bibles, uh, you can grab those out. It's Ruth chapter 2. We're going to read through the entire chapter this morning together, and it'll be up there on the screen for us as well. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained there from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go in and glean another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. And she asked him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, who, under whose wings you have come to take refuge." May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing even of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain and she ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until the evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it mounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. And her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth, her mother-in-law, then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finished harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work with him for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Lots in those 23 verses that uh, continue on this unfolding story of Ruth. Straight away in the, at the start, in the first couple of verses, the writer here of Ruth is setting the scene for us and they want us to know some specific details. And firstly, that is that Naomi has this relative and his name's Boaz, 
and he is from this clan of Elimelech, which is his family line. So, we know his family line, his name, and that he's related to Naomi. And the writer tells us these things because later on in the chapter, when we meet, uh, when we first see Boaz and Ruth meet up, we are already then in the know about who this guy, Boaz, is. And so, Ruth remains with Naomi, she heads back to Bethlehem, the barley harvest is about to begin. Now, given her circumstances, given everything that's happened in chapter one, given the way that Naomi's responded even to Ruth by telling her, you know, call me bitter, Ruth would have had every right to probably follow in Naomi's footsteps, you know, grumble, sit around in her sorrows as a widow, or dream of better days in the past. She could have done that. She could have actually joined Naomi in her state of bitterness and and hopelessness, but she doesn't. Ruth has a plan. And she says to Naomi, let me go out, I want to get a job. You've probably heard of um, having fight or flight type scenarios. When we're faced with these difficult situations, we're prone to doing one of these two things. Sometimes we'll fight and that means we will do in our own power usually whatever it takes to weather the storm or the difficulty that is in front of us. And other times when we're facing difficulties, we might kind of retreat go back into our own shells, not do anything. We kind of pause and take stock of the situation before we make our next move. And that is, there's wisdom in doing so. Um, There's wisdom in pausing and, and surveying the landscape. But I think we can only survey for so long before the next question is, what is my next move? And that is where Ruth finds herself at this point in time. She doesn't know what's ahead of her in the future. She has no idea but she knows that her next move is to go out and get a job and provide for her and Naomi to do what is needed, to take action, to get moving. And so she asks for Naomi's permission to go and pick the leftover grain, or glean as it is called. Now, when it came to harvesting wheat fields in this time, what would happen is the reapers would, would harvest the field and they would reap the grain, but when they reached the edge or the corners of the field, they would make this circular motion. And in doing so, they would actually leave the heads of grain or leave the corners of the wheat field untouched as they were. And so the grain would be, grain would be standing in those corners. And this was a part of Israelite law. In Leviticus 19, God says this to His people, He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. So, this is part of God's command that He has given to the Israelite people. And we see the concern here that God has for the poor and for the foreigner in allowing them to glean these fields. So, Naomi says, yes, I give you my permission, off you go, start working. Now, at this point, as someone gleaning in the land, um, Ruth really can enter into any field that she likes at any time, (coughs) excuse me, and begin to glean. And in verse 3, It just so happens that out of every single field that Ruth could have chosen at a time when many would have been harvesting, she enters this field that belongs to Boaz. Uh, Years ago, Cherie and I, uh, before we had kids, we we lived and volunteered at a children's village in Thailand, in central Thailand, and we were on these three-month visas as a part of our our time there. And so, that basically meant that every three months, we had to do a border run just to make sure the authorities knew where we were at any given time. And the shortest border from where we were located in central Thailand was actually the Lao border. It was about three, three and a half hours from memory. And so, we were getting ready. It was coming up to our three months. We had to go and do our border run, as it was called. So, we'd booked our date in to do that border run. But as the day drew closer, we actually realised the expense to actually process your visas was a little bit more costly than what we had available at the time. We didn't have enough money to be able to process our visas. We were being supported by this team of sponsors at the time, but at that particular point in time, we just didn't have enough money in our situation. Anyway, the night before we are set to leave, we received this knock at our door. 
and it's one of the teachers from the Thai school as, pa as a part of the children's village. And this teacher had just returned from Australia. She'd been on an assignment back here to, to learn and, and to, to teach alongside others. And she'd just returned back home to Thailand from Australia. And we caught up with her, it was really great. And then as she's about to leave, she hands us this envelope. And this envelope was from someone, some of our friends back here in Australia. And, and she said, oh, by the way, this is for you. And so she left that night. And as we opened up that envelope after she had left, we saw money inside that envelope. Now, the amount of money was the exact amount of money that we needed to process our visas the next day. You see, out of all the fields that Ruth could have entered during harvest season, out of all of the options she had, she enters this field that's owned by Boaz. This is no accident. You know, this is a part of the outworking of God's care and God's provision for Ruth and Naomi. God's sovereignty, His supreme authority is on display here as He works in and through this situation. Now, this does not mean that we are like pawns in a chess game and God gets to pick us up and move us about wherever it is that He wants us to move. It's not that we don't have com control over what we do. You know, Ruth is the one who's requested to glean. Naomi's the one who's made the decision or given her permission. Ruth has then entered this field and Boaz has chosen to harvest at this exact particular time when Ruth enters the field. All of these decisions, all of these factors made by each individual, these were all instruments in God's hands for His provision and for His care of Ruth and Naomi. You know, God is distinct, He is holy, He is set apart from His creation, He is greater than all of His creation and yet He is a God who is concerned for us, so much so that He is intimately involved in every single detail of His creation. Isn't that amazing? It's a great reminder for us that God is sovereign over all, that He is the one who is God and that He is the one who is in control. And this is one of the reasons for you and I why we should be filled with hope, is that God is sovereign, is that God is the one who's in control. Next, we see that Boaz arrives on the scene, and in this scene, we learn a bit more about his character and who Ruth is as well. Now, like I said before, there would have been um, many fields operating at that time. There would have been many other people in the fields gleaning at that particular time alongside Ruth. But Boaz, who's the owner of this particular field, he particularly takes notice of Ruth. He inquires about her. He wants to know who Ruth is. He asks his field overseer, who is that lady? And he learns that she's been gleaning all day apart from a really short rest. Uh, we've just had our Carols Spectacular, a fantastic event that we have at the end of every year. And as a part of that, the kids section is usually a pretty big highlight for many people and for many different reasons. Now, a lot of the rehearsals that took place for our Carols happened right here in this auditorium. And one thing that I would notice um, as we got closer and closer to the show and as, as the kids started to rehearse through their entire sections is that sometimes the parents, uh, in dropping their kids off, they would just kind of hang around and want to have a look at a little bit of the kids section. And what I noticed is parents will take in the entire thing, everything that's happening on stage with the kids. It looks great. But then if you pay particular attention to a particular parent, it's not long before you see their eyes will head straight for their own child. They have a particular care, a particular interest in their own child. Sometimes they'll even video it on their phone, and it's so funny. It won't be zoomed out taking in the whole thing? No, it'll be zoomed right in on their own child, focused in on them and what they are doing. That parent-child relationship is such a beautiful one to watch and in the same way, this is a reminder for us about who God is in our lives. On one hand, we might seem small, insignificant, we might seem undeserving of attention, we might feel like we go unnoticed, we might feel like we're undeserving of good things, but regardless of how you feel, regardless of how you perceive yourself, God the Father 
sees you. His child. You're his creation. And he has an interest in you. And he focuses on you. He wants you to know who he is. And you and him to know you. He wants to be with you, to walk with you, to celebrate with you, to cry with you, to do life with you. And so, this is another reason to be filled with hope, for us to be hopeful, is that God sees you. And then the conversation switches in verse 8, and we see here that Boaz has his first discussion with Ruth. And he tells her these things. Um, so there's several things. He says, don't go and glean another field. He says, don't go away from here. Stay with my servant women. Watch the field where the men are harvesting. Follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. Whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the jars that the men have filled. Now, let's just stop for a minute right here and let's appreciate the situation from Ruth's perspective because these are some real employee benefits that the big boss is handing down to Ruth and Ruth isn't even on the payroll. You know, Boaz is offering Ruth much more, much more than the ordinary rights of gleanage that she would be entitled to. If think about this, if, if you've got an employer, this is kind of like your employer, you rocking up to work and, and your employer saying to you, okay, today you have access to the best equipment that you need to perform your job today. Not just the standard stuff, the best equipment. You know, we're going to spend and get you the best stuff that you need. Oh, and by the way, I've got all your coffee sorted. I'll just bring that to you. You just let me know the time. I've got your lunch sorted as well. We'll get that sorted. Um, anytime you feel like a, a, a cold drink or you need to have a break or maybe, you know, play, play a little bit of Candy Crush, you can do that. Just, just relax, you know, take your time, then come back. Oh, and did I mention that I'm actually going to pay you triple time and a half for the work that you do today? See, the generosity of Boaz, the owner of this field, is on display. His graciousness is here on display, and it's on full display for Ruth. He helps her out in absolutely every aspect. And when it came to the way that uh, Ruth would have expected Boaz to respond to her, she would have probably been prepared for the worst. She would have been waiting for him to maybe say, okay, you know, time for you to move on. I've got some other people coming through. She would have just probably been trying to get through the day with everything that she had faced. She's dealt with pain. She's dealt with this difficult situation. But here we see this extraordinary provision, this absolutely radical, extreme provision from Boaz, and Ruth is just completely overwhelmed by it. In verse 10, it says that at this she bowed down with her face to the ground and she asked him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you would notice me a foreigner. You know, Ruth is saying, me, why me of all people? Why? Why do you notice me? You might have asked that question before at times in your own life. You know, Ruth is so overwhelmed and she's so surprised at this response that not only has Boaz noticed who she is, but Boaz has graciously provided for Ruth. And she doesn't expect this, he doesn't have to do this, but he still does, does it anyway. In our lives, our God provides many things for us from our basic needs, from food to clothing to shelter, right through to much bigger things. When it comes to being provided for, when Jesus was on the earth, He told us we're not to worry about what we would eat or what we would drink, that the birds of the air don't sow or reap, and yet their Heavenly Father feeds them. And then He asks this question, He says, are you not much more valuable than those birds? In our lives, our God provides everything that we need. And sometimes that provision, it'll happen in ways that we don't expect. You know, maybe you've been asking God to provide for you in a certain way, but it just hasn't turned out the way that you're expecting. The Israelites, they didn't expect manna on the ground when they grumbled about being hungry, but God provided Sometimes we ask God for certain things, thinking, oh, we need, I need this one certain specific thing in my life. And it's like that thing will allow me then to kind of unlock the next level or take the next step forward in, in life. But you know what? God knows what you and I need. When it comes to gifts, we've just celebrated the greatest gift at Christmas time, Jesus, 
The greatest thing that we could already receive from God has been given to us, hasn't it? That's the gospel, the good news of Jesus and who Jesus is. God's own son, he came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He chose willingly to go to the cross for you and I to take on our sin, to die, and then he was risen again to life that we might be able to have a relationship with God through Jesus. So we should be filled with hope. Why? Because we have a God who provides for us. And He doesn't just provide for us sometime, He provides for us in every way. In verse 11, Boaz then has his reply to Ruth. And what he says is a real affirmation to her. In, in everything that she's done through her situation to get to this point, Ruth, uh, Boaz says this to her, verse 11, I've been told about all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and you came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You know, Boaz recognises that through this entire hopeless situation, that God is the one that Ruth's actually placed her faith in. God's the one that she has looked to at every step, at every twist, at every turn in her journey to this point. Her hope hasn't been in what she can do, in her own abilities. Her hope hasn't been in other things, around her or circumstances, her hope has been in God alone and the generosity of Boaz and these words that he says, it really speaks to this. But you know what? That generosity, it doesn't stop there. It just keeps on going. In verse 14 and 15, we find out that Ruth gets welcome to eat this midday meal with Boaz and so they sit and she eats everything she wants to her till she's completely content and we learn that there's also leftovers. She's so content, she's got a stomach of food, she's ready to go out and start gleaning again. This is after, after the midday meal. But before she goes, Boaz says, hang on a minute, I want to tell you a few other things. He wants to give her another favour. He says, you know, Ruth, you can gather among the sheaves, but not only that, my employees, my other workers, um, pull out some of the stalks for Ruth from the bundles and, and drop them and let Ruth pick those up. And the result here is really pretty incredible because in verse 17, we find out that Ruth gleans right up until the evening. Ruth and Naomi, well, that, she came back home that day with enough barley to, be, for them, to allow them to be able to eat for more than a week. So you can imagine the surprise that Naomi has on her face when Ruth returns home here. I mean, she's not expecting this. She's probably just expecting Ruth to come home with just enough food for them to get by to their next meal the next day. But her question then to to, uh, to Ruth isn't, how did you do this? Her question to Ruth is, where did you glean? Because Naomi knows, okay, wherever you've gone, someone's taken care of you. They've really taken care of you. She's very aware that what she's brought in is more than an average day's haul of barley. And Naomi's response is a really interesting one. For someone who has every right to be feeling downcast and hopeless in this situation, she exclaims to Ruth, blessed be the man who took notice of you. And this tells us that she's pleasantly surprised with the situation. And then Ruth tells her about Boaz and what he did for her and all the privileges that she got. And this is important because then Naomi says the following in verse 20. She says that he, or Boaz, has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And then she added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now the story thickens, the plot thickens. Because the Hebrew word for a guardian redeemer is this legal term. And and it basically meant if, if you were a guardian redeemer, you had this legal obligation. If you had a relative, someone related to you, who found themselves under troubling, difficult circumstances, you are actually obligated to redeem or rescue or help that particular person. 
and we're actually going to get to hear a little bit more about this as we go into chapter 3 of Ruth next week. Uh, But to end this chapter, Naomi gives her endorsement to Ruth. She says, it's going to be good for you to continue to harvest in Boaz's field until the end of the harvest, so stay here and do that. And that's what we learn that Ruth does. She stays with Naomi and she harvests until the end of the harvest. I want to invite the musos to come on up. And so as we pause here and, and we, we think about the way this chapter has ended compared to chapter one, it's quite a different note from what has seemed like a hopeless situation in Ruth and Naomi's life. We see that hope has been restored. God has seen Ruth and Naomi. He's been with them every single step of their journey along the way. He has provided for them with great abundance. He's blessed them greatly. And Ruth trusted in God. She remained faithful throughout, despite the difficulties. Her hope was secure in God, especially when everything was going wrong around her, especially in those trying times. But you know what? Her hope was also in God in those good times. When things started going well, she recognised that He was the one alone who was providing for her. Maybe you've entered the new year this year full of hope and you've been able to kind of pause and reflect and look back and see just how God's been with you and been working in and through your life, how He's provided for you and cared for you at every twist and turn and you're thankful. That's a response of just thankfulness and gratitude for our God who is the one who has done that. And so like Ruth, your hope in some, some sense is strengthened. And maybe you've entered this new year with some difficulty. Maybe there's a situation right now, even in your life, that seems a bit hopeless. There's something that's unresolved and you just do not see the way forward. You don't know how this is ever going to come to any sort of resolution. You know, maybe it's a relationship in your life that just seems like there's no way forward. Maybe it's direction, the New Year's come around and you're not too sure what 2023 holds for you, what the future looks like. You're not sure what you should be doing or where you should be going. And maybe it's a health issue. Maybe you're dealing with pain and suffering right now. Maybe it's focus, you're feeling like you don't know where to direct your focus and your attention and everywhere you do it seems kind of like a dead end. Or maybe you've been placing your hope in other things, whether it's relationships, maybe it's work and our identity in work, money, wealth, maybe it's status or being noticed or receiving more attention. Whatever it is, hope in those things will ultimately only lead to disappointment because there is only one source of everlasting hope and that hope is Jesus. So whatever it is that you are facing or whatever it is that you are joyful for, we can hold on to these truths that we've learned this morning from this chapter. We can cling to them, we can be reassured of them in and through every situation in our lives. That God sees you. That God is in control and that God provides. Now, our mission here as a church at Brackenridge is to experience and to share the life, the freedom, and the hope, that hope that is found in Jesus. And every single one of us is able to do that because of these truths of who our God is, what He's done for us, and what He'll continue to do for us in the future. Let's pray together. God, we want to thank you for this story of Ruth. Thank you for the picture of hope that it is. Lord, in our lifetimes, you've said that things won't be easy, but you've promised that you will be with us to the end of the age. And so we thank you that our hope is secure in you. We thank you that you see us, that you care so deeply about the intricate details of our lives that you're willing to be involved in them. 
We thank you that you're in control, that we aren't the ones who need to try and make sure we've got absolutely every aspect of our lives together, God. But you are the one who is in control and you are the one who provides. Oh God, we thank you. We just pause right now and we just say thank you. Thank you for the way in which you provide in our lives, great God. We thank you for the hope that there is in you, Jesus. And God, I pray right now for anyone who is experiencing a difficulty, Lord, that you would be near to them, that the hope that we have in you would be one that becomes more and more real to them as they turn towards you. For those who are grateful, I pray, Lord, that just that joy would just overflow. The hope that we have in you would overflow, would strengthen us. And for those who maybe are looking at other things or other ways, Lord, I pray that they would turn their hope and recognize that it is in you and you alone. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are. And we thank you, God, for the way that you provide and work. We pray these things in Jesus' name.